Hey, good evening and welcome to Sunday Night Lake. It's great to have you with us this evening. We had some technical problems which means we weren't able to go live online tonight but this recording hopefully will do the job and um, before we start just have a couple of things to mention obviously we've heard the news yesterday that um, the Portsmouth Gospel and Haven't areas are now in tier 4 which is obviously very restrictive in terms of what we can actually do at the moment. Um, churches, places of worship are still allowed to gather which is great news um, but there obviously there is a lot of restrictions within that. So what we decided to do was leave any in-person gatherings until the 10th of January or that weekend. So it's still our plan at the moment, if we can, to restart Momentum on the 8th of January and then Sunday Night Local on the Sunday evening the 10th of January and also our plan for Kids Church and Ignition on Sunday mornings from the 10th of January, if we can, if that's allowed. So we're going to keep our eye on what uh, guidelines are put out for places of worship and obviously uh, seek some advice from Assemblies of God and Evangelical Alliance and just um, make sure that we, we know what's what's going on and, and what we're allowed to do and what we're not allowed to do. Um, so that's the first thing. Um, second thing is, um, before I forget, I just want to uh, wish everyone a really, really good Christmas. I know obviously for many plans have had to change and uh, there's a lot of disappointment, I think, um, at the moment regarding that because people were looking forward to having time with family and friends. Um, and Carla and I just want you to know that, that we are committed to praying for you, that we love you, that um, we are still believing for an end to this um, coronavirus and um, we're believing for, uh, in the new year, that things are going to open up again and uh, things are going to move at a pace in the right direction. That's what we're believing for. So stand with us. Um, if there's anything to pray for right now, it's that uh, we would be free of this virus and secondly for our government, that our government would have great wisdom and that they would uh, make good decisions um, at this time. So um, this evening I want to share a word on the subject of God with us and we're going to start in John chapter 1 verses 1 to 14. Before we read that let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, that you would speak through me this evening, that um, this word that I believe you've placed on my heart, it would really uh, touch the hearts of your people, Lord, that it would minister to, that it would um, really bring a, a fresh understanding of what it is to be a people who have been given access to your presence. And I pray, Lord, that as I speak tonight, um, Holy Spirit, that you would just talk through me. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Wonderful. So, um, John chapter 1, verses 1 to 14, it says this. In the beginning was the Word. Now, that word, word, in the Greek, is the word logos. Uh, so, in the beginning was the logos. Logos means a word uttered by a living voice. So, God has always existed. He wasn't created. God is. God is always has been and God has always existed as a triune God the Father the Son the Holy Spirit uh, or the Father the Word and the Holy Spirit and so um, the Word of God who became flesh 2,000 years ago was involved in creation the Word was spoken the Father spoke the Word went forth and creation happened and so um, in this passage here the word word, logos, um, is literally, it's referring to the Son, it's referring to Jesus, it's referring to that of part of God that became flesh and stepped into this world. Okay, so in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend or did not overcome it. So the word of God became flesh. It stepped into this world, and it shone like light in this world. That's what Jesus did when he stepped into this world. And the darkness, the devil, the enemy, nothing of the darkness could overcome it, because the light is greater than the darkness. 
verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came as a witness, or for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all through the light might believe. He wasn't the light, but was sent to bear witness of the light. That true that was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. So the light that has been referred to is Jesus, the light of the world. It says in verse 10, He was in the world and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave, he, he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name who were not who were born not of blood nor of the will of the flesh nor of the will of man but of God so we understand that when we put our faith in Jesus this internal transformation takes place and we are spiritually made new we're born of God born again and that's what this is talking about there everyone who receives Jesus everyone who believes in him um, becomes a child of God and it says in verse 14, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. What incredible uh, truth this is, that um, Jesus, the word of God, became flesh, stepped into this world, and we beheld his glory. Um, and, and I'm so grateful that I've beheld his glory, that I'm, I'm one of those who accepted the light in my life. Um, I love the fact that Jesus was full of grace and truth. You know, when Jesus walked in this world, he was full of grace. Um, he displayed the grace of God wherever he went, and he spoke the truth of God. And grace always comes first. It's important that grace comes first. If you just start with truth, if it's just truth, 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 um, it, it can be harsh and it's not received. But Jesus um, brought grace and truth. He, he started with grace. He started by accepting and loving. And then he spoke truth and it was received by people. So God created the earth. He created planet earth. And planet earth was designed to be the eternal dwelling place of God's most precious creation, mankind. The realm of God, heaven completely overlapped the realm of the earth. There was no divide between the spiritual and the natural. They completely overlapped um, as one. Now in the very beginning, Adam and Eve walked on this planet earth that was an eternal place, the paradise of God, otherwise known as Eden, that had been created for them um, to walk in unblemished, unblemished relationship with God. Nothing hindered Adam and Eve from experiencing God's presence until they sinned. God's holy. Sin can't be in the presence of God. So at the point that man, so at that point, mankind became separated from God's presence. And they were left in a world that became detached from the realm of heaven. There was now a divide between the spiritual, the realm of heaven, and the natural, the realm of earth. Mankind had become spiritually dead, and life on earth was now temporal. Moreover, without spiritual restoration, men and women would end their days on planet earth, separated from God for eternity. But we know that it's God's will that none should perish. It's his will that every human being should be restored into a relationship with him and have free access into his presence. That's the will of God. God already knew that sin would enter the world and already had an eternal plan that existed before he even created the earth. Um, his, a plan to redeem mankind, a plan to restore men and women into an eternal relationship with himself. I love that this is revealed in, in little glimpses throughout scripture. One of them is in Revelation 13 verse 8. Jesus is described as the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. It was already part of God's plan. So when Adam and Eve sinned and they became separated from God's presence, they stepped out of that unblemished relationship with God. God already had a plan to restore his creation
back into relationship with him. Now from the very first animal sacrifice that was made, um, that God made when he provided Adam and Eve with those, uh, those coverings of animal skins to cover their nakedness after they had sinned, um, all the way through to the moment that Jesus laid down his life, um, that we, we see a picture um, of what God was planning to do through Jesus, um, a foreshadowing of what God was planning to do through Jesus. God's plan was to deal with sin and right from the, from the very moment that Adam and Eve sinned and, and God began this work of restoration so that man could come back into his presence. Now in the Old Testament God chose the children of Israel as his own special people um, who he would walk in relationship with and who would experience his presence. So from the get-go God began a work of restoration, of redemption of, of mankind. Now God's people through the law became aware of God's perfect standard of living. This is why the law was given to show what God expected from mankind. Um, it, it showed people God's perfect standard of living as well as their inability to keep it because the issue was deeper than just following the rules. There was something within the nature of man now that caused mankind to live in sin. It's called the sinful nature and that had to be dealt with um, and that wasn't yet dealt with. The law simply showed the people that they couldn't live according to God's rules. Through the prophets, God spoke to his people and they were pointed back to God. Every time that they as a nation messed up, they walked away from God, the prophets would point them back to God. And of course, the prophets also spoke of the one who would come in the future, the deliverer, the Messiah, the saviour, to save his people from their sin. And also, uh, God instituted the law, the prophets and the priesthood. The priesthood were those who... Um, the people through the priesthood were atoned of their sin or cleansed of their sin when animal sacrifices were offered in the tabernacle on behalf of the people. Those innocent animals would take the place of the guilty. The innocence of those animals would become the people's innocence. And so they would be temporarily right before God. This made way for God to dwell in the midst of his people. God's presence filled the Holy of Holies, which was the very centre part of the tabernacle where the priests ministered. And King David loved the presence of God and it was on his heart to build a more permanent place where God could dwell in the midst of his people. And that place was the temple. So the temple replaced the tabernacle. David, of course, couldn't build the temple because he was a man of war. And his son Solomon ended up building this glorious, incredible temple that was in the midst of the children of Israel. And the day of dedication of the temple was an incredible day where God's presence filled the temple and spilled out uh, from the temple um, just uh, temporarily. So in 2 Chronicles 5, verse 13 to 14, in the message it says this, regarding that day of dedication when the Ark of the Covenant was placed in the Holy of Holies, when God's presence filled the Holy of Holies of the temple. It says, Then a billowing cloud filled the temple of God. The priests couldn't even carry out their duties because of the cloud. The glory of God that filled the temple of God. In another version it says the priests couldn't even continue to minister. They couldn't even stand. They, they fell before God. They were consumed with the presence of God. So yet, even when God's presence filled this temple, this permanent or more permanent dwelling place um, for God in the midst of his people, this still wasn't, of course, a complete restoration of what Adam and Eve had in Eden in the very beginning. There was more to come. At this stage God's relationship with the Jewish people was simply a temporary cleansing of sin with people attempting to walk holy before God by obeying the law. But without an internal change this was totally impossible. The law again it was just it just showed them what they were doing wrong. It says in Romans 3 verse 20. Therefore by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. In fact, all the law really achieved was to show God's people 
that they couldn't live up to God's perfect standard, that they needed a saviour. Galatians 3 verse 24 points to the saviour. It says, therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. It was our tutor. It led us to Christ, that we might be justified, not by our works, but by our faith. So everything in the Old Testament, the law, the prophets, the priesthood, the temple, was simply a shadow or a foreshadowing of what would come when God stepped into the world himself, providing the ultimate sacrifice for sin. And that was Jesus laying down his life. Just as those animal sacrifices were given, Jesus was the perfect Lamb of God that was slain before the foundation of the world, slain for the salvation of all mankind. So may we, this Christmas time, remember the ultimate purpose of the Word, the Word of God taking on the suit of flesh, God stepping into this world, Jesus coming into this world. The purpose was to deal with sin so that mankind could be back in the presence of God. God created us for fellowship. He created us so that he could be with us. Adam and Eve were created for fellowship with God. Mankind, you and I, we were created for fellowship with God. And if we don't have access to God's presence, then we don't have fellowship with God. So Jesus came into this world to deal with sin so that we could come back into the presence of God. And it says in Matthew chapter 1 verse 23, God with us, it says, So all this was done that, might, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, that was Isaiah, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. So Jesus himself, when he stepped into this world, he brought the presence of God with him. God stepped into this world, but... That wasn't God's um, ultimate plan. He, he couldn't be everywhere at once, Jesus. Um, he was simply a vessel that stepped into this world, carried God's presence, did incredible miracles, was the saviour, lived a perfect life and laid down his life on the cross so that God himself, the Holy Spirit, could come and dwell with his people, every person who would put their faith in Jesus. No longer would man... Uh, mankind attempt to live up to God's perfect standards by the deeds of the law, um, our righteousness now would come through faith in the one who stepped into this world and took our punishment on the cross once for all sin, Jesus. So he did it. He lived up to God's perfect standard and when we put our faith in him we receive his righteousness. Our sin is transferred onto him the one who took the punishment for our sin, who took all of the condemnation, all of the punishment, paid the price in full, and his righteousness became ours the moment we put our faith in Jesus. Galatians 3 verse 11 says, But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. The just shall not live by the law. The just, those who are justified in God's sight, that happens when we put our faith in Christ. So our faith in Jesus brings about an internal internal transformation. When you put your faith in Jesus, whatever that was, when you first believed, an internal miracle took place, a transformation, a deep spiritual cleansing, a restoration to a state of righteousness that goes way beyond the deeds of the law. It deals with the very nature of sin rather than just the forgiveness of sin or the cleansing of sin. That has happened in your life and in my life. This is true of every person that has put their faith in Christ. We now live in a state of righteousness before God. We live in a state of righteousness before God. That means we have continual access to his presence because there is no now no sin. We are holy temples that God chooses to come and dwell in not only that but we ourselves we, we are these temples of God so this is true of every every one of us 
Our, our body has become a temple of the Holy Spirit, a cleansed vessel that God wants to fill with his presence. And this is the first thing that happened in the book of Acts. When Jesus left the world, um, he promised that he would send his Holy Spirit. So he promised that God himself would come by his spirit and fill the lives of his people, that God would fill his people. And it says in Acts 2 verses 1 to 4, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. These people who had put their faith in Jesus, they had now become holy and God was now able to come and fill their lives individually and together. They were filled with the Holy Spirit of God. They were filled with God's presence and not just filled, but utterly saturated with God's presence. They, they were like, they, they, they were changed. They staggered out of that upper room afterwards. Um, they were like drunk people, drunk on the presence of God, drunk on the Spirit of God. They spoke with other tongues. There was like a bubbling up of God's Spirit in their lives that caused their, their own spirit man to, to be just, to, to, to just be transformed. And it was amazing. So the 120 disciples who were in the upper room weren't just now in God's presence. God's presence was in them. There was a new temple in town. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 16 says, Do you not know that you're a temple of the Holy Spirit? Uh, sorry, a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19 says, Do you not know that your body is a temple, is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? And you're not your own. You were bought at a price. That was a, the greatest price of all. It was the blood of Jesus that was shed for us. Therefore, if God was willing to do that for us, therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. And I think that's a, a great um, challenge for us. Um, a great command for us is, is that we, as people who have been transformed by God, we should glorify God in our body and our spirit, which are God's. So as individual believers, we're the temple of God. Effectively, what it's saying is, is we're the holy of holies. You're the holy of holies, the very dwelling place of God. And we have unlimited access to God's presence. So let's make sure we look after these temples, as we just read in uh, 1 Corinthians there. Um, Therefore glorify God in your body. Let's look after these temples. And I'm not just speaking about our physical health and well-being, but also let's ensure that we don't defile these temples, use them for unclean things. The truth is that we have been cleansed and we are God's dwelling place. That is the truth about your life and about my life because we've put our faith in Christ. We repented of our sin, we put our faith in Christ and that is the truth. It was a work of God that took place the moment that we received the light of God. That word that became flesh by repenting of our sin, putting our faith in Jesus. Our salvation is based on our faith in Christ alone, not on our works. No one can be, can be saved by our works, as we read just now. But so often, we feel like we've lost God's presence when we sin or when we do wrong. I've been thinking about that. What, why do we feel that way? If, if actually the truth is that um, I've been cleansed of sin um, and I'm God's dwelling place, why do I feel like I've lost God's presence when, when I do something wrong or sin? Um, we feel like God's left us because we've allowed sin in. But the truth is that when God looks at us, he sees no sin, only a cleansed temple that he loves to dwell in. And I'm not saying at all in any way that we can therefore just go ahead and do whatever we like because God's not going to leave us. No, um, if you keep on defiling that temple uh, that has been cleansed, then eventually that's going to have an effect on the temple. Um, but actually, the truth is that often 
the reason we enter into a time of sin or do wrong is because we haven't been enjoying God's presence or allowing God's presence to fill these temples like we should. Um, it, it, it's not a question of losing God's presence when we sin, but actually maybe we sin because we aren't engaging with God's presence as we should be. Um, but also it's the way we think as well. I, I reckon um, you know, we live in a world that everything you get that's good, you get because you've achieved something, you've, you've done certain things, you've worked towards it. Um, but that's not how it works, is it, with salvation? Um, so I think it's partly because of the way we think. We often feel terribly condemned and, and feel like our sin is all that God can see when the truth is that there's no condemnation in Christ. God doesn't see our sin. He only sees the blood of Jesus that has cleansed us from all sin. So I've got to keep these temples clean. Uh, and the best way to do that is, I think, remember who we are. Remember that we are a cleansed temple that God wants to fill with his presence. I believe it's really important that we keep our guard up regarding temptation because the enemy wants to destroy the temple and he comes in crafty and subtle ways to do so. So let's make sure we we uh, keep these temp temples clean. Whenever we become aware of anything that could cause damage to these temples, that could cause them to become defiled, let's be bold enough to deal with those things. How do we deal with those things? How do we deal with sin? Confess it, admit that you've got something wrong, and repent of it. Well, that means turn your back on it, turn away from it. And, and sometimes it's necessary to confess our sins one to another, as scripture says. In other words, find a Christian brother or sister that you trust that you can confess your sin to. Because actually, sometimes you need the help from another person to get you through that, to help you to overcome it. Um, perhaps you need to be accountable to someone in that area of your life. So, not only are we the temple of God, the holy temple of God individually, we're also the temple of God as a community of believers. On a global level, the church is the temple of God. On a local level, the church is the temple of God that he loves to fill with his presence. Ephesians 2 verses 19 to 22. This is from New Living Translation. I read this one last Sunday morning when I was sharing. It says this. So now you Gentiles, you're no longer strangers and foreigners. You're citizens. Citizens along with all of God's holy people. You're members of God's family. Together we are his house or his temple built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined in him, joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. What an awesome truth that is. So along with every Jew who has put their faith in Christ, us Gentiles, us non-Jews who have put our faith in Christ have become a holy temple in God that God loves to fill with his presence. Um, in second, uh, First Peter chapter 2, it says we, the believers, are, um, are living stones. Not just a, a dead rock, we're living stones. We are lives, people who are filled with the vibrant, life-giving spirit of God and God is putting us together and creating this incredible dwelling place that he comes to live in um, and God's plan for his dwelling place the church on the earth is that the church wouldn't just contain God and keep God to ourselves but that um, God would flow out from this temple and affect the world around us. God's desire um, to be present with mankind is fulfilled through those who have put their faith in Christ and become part of his holy and glorious temple in, in this world, the church. Through this holy temple, God is reaching those who are lost. God's light is shining through this temple, um, through his church, into the world around us. The Holy Spirit is flowing like a river into the driest and most broken parts of this world, or should I say, into the driest and most broken people around us. 
God wants to flow through his church into the world around us. And as I said last Sunday morning, if we're going to be effective in reaching the lost, then this temple, both individually and together, corporately, must be filled with the Holy Spirit, with the Spirit of God, so that the river of God's Spirit can flow out from us. Remember I said last week, Jesus stood up in the midst of the, the Feast of Tabernacles on that great day and said, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink, because Jesus is the living water. And so our responsibility is to recognise that we have been cleansed of sin, that we're holy temples of God, and that God wants to fill us with his Holy Spirit. He wants to fill us with his presence. And then Jesus said, out of his belly will, or out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And that's what God wants to do. It's not just for us. It's for the world around us. The church isn't um, a bless me club. The church is has been called and ordained by God to um, to bring the life and the light of God to the world around us. So what we've got now is is so much more than uh, the people in the Old Testament had. Um, so Adam and Eve, they had the full expression of God's presence, unbroken fellowship with God. They never left God's presence until sin came in and then they were completely separated from God. And God started his plan of restoration. In the Old Testament, uh, the Jewish people... Uh, were able to come close to God. Uh, God dwelt in the midst of his people, but not in his people. He, he dwelt in the, temp the tabernacle and then the temple. Um, but God wanted more. So Jesus stepped into this world and Jesus made the way for those who believe in him to be completely cleansed of all sin, uh, for that sin nature to be dealt with, so that God could fill our lives with his presence once again just as Adam and Eve had that unbroken fellowship with God we too can have that unbroken fellowship with God but we still live in a world that is dying we still live in a fallen and a broken world um, where there are multitudes of people who remain outside of God's presence and only when a believer reaches heaven will they actually see in full and have a complete and unbroken experience of God's presence for eternity and it says in 1 Corinthians 13 verses 9 to 12 this is from the New Living Translation 1 Corinthians 13 9 to 12 now our knowledge sorry now our knowledge is partial and incomplete and even the gift of prophecy only reveals part of the whole picture but when the time of perfection comes these partial things will become useless when I was a child I spoke and I thought and I reasoned as a child, but when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then, when we go to heaven, we will see everything with perfect clarity. All I know is now is partial and incomplete. Sorry, all I know now is partial and incomplete, but then... I will know everything completely, just as God knows me completely. Love that. So whilst we live on this earth, we're like children who haven't quite grown up yet, whose experience of God's presence is incredible and awesome, but partial. In the sense that when we get to heaven, we won't have this veil anymore. And this veil is the fact that we live in a broken and fallen world, surrounded by multitudes of those that and not believers, and that this world is, is dying. What an awesome thing to have the presence of God. What an awesome thing to be called by God a holy temple, and to have his presence in our lives. Today and this Christmas, I pray that we will remember that God is with us, God with us, Emmanuel. Just, uh, I wanna just finish by answering two questions, simple questions, or well, one question, sorry with two answers why does God want to dwell with us and the first answer is this he loves us God wants to be with us we were made for fellowship with God and we are incomplete without fellowship with God we're incomplete when we don't have God's presence so God wants to be with God God wants to dwell with us because he loves us he wants fellowship with 
with us. He wants us to know his presence. And he wants us present with him. And the second answer to that question, why does God want to dwell with us, is because he loves the lost. He wants to flow through our lives, through his temple, us individually, and his church, like a river. Through God's presence in our lives, people around us, people in this world, can taste of the goodness of God. They can catch a glimpse of the glory of God. They can experience his love and mercy. So it's absolutely vital that we are filled with the Holy Spirit, that we're filled with the presence of God. And being filled with the Holy Spirit is such a simple thing. It's continual. It's something that every day we just need to ask God to fill our lives. And the best way to do that is just to separate yourself, to just spend time um, just alone with God, even if it's just for a few minutes at the start of every day, and ask God, the Holy Spirit, to fill your life, to saturate you, to overwhelm you, to drench you with his Holy Spirit. And God is so ready for that. God, God is so ready to fill your life with his Spirit on a daily basis. Ephesians um, 5 verse 18 says, Be filled, be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. So Jesus came so that we could dwell in God's presence, but also so that God's presence could dwell in us. I pray today that you will be filled with the presence of God, that you will be filled with the Holy Spirit. In fact, let me pray for you right now. Father, I thank you for every person who has watched or listened to uh, this recording this evening. I pray, Father, that we would be a people uh, who are hungry for your presence. Lord, a, a people who are thirsty for your living water. I pray, Father, that even now you would fill us with your spirit. Lord, we love your presence. We love the, the feeling of your presence in our lives. We thank you, Lord, that you don't hold back in any way, but God, you fill us with your presence. And I pray that even as people watch this tonight and listen to these words, they'll just sense your presence in their lives. Father, I thank you that this isn't uh, for, for just selfish reasons although we love just to be with you Lord but Lord part of this is because you want to flow through our lives and you want to reach this lost world so I pray Father that we will be a people that don't just drink of your presence but allow your river to flow out of our lives both individually and as a church and I pray this in Jesus name Amen Amen God bless you thanks for listening and I pray that you have a wonderful Christmas, a wonderful New Year, and we will see you, I really hope, in the New Year real soon. God bless.